What do you do on Sundays? We talk about Kate Blanchett, the acting, the costumes, the awards, but mostly the Blanchett of it all. Oh, oh. I'm not acting. <laughs> you think this is a love affair? I saw you, Erica, meeting in the middle. This is Sundays with Kate, and I'm your host, Mortada El Fadi. Welcome to Sundays with Kate, the podcast series about the films of Kate Blanchett. Thank you for your patience while we regrouped after our first season of 13 episodes. We're back. This is your host, Mortada El Fadi. And with me today on the first episode of the three episodes about Blue Jasmine is writer and critic Matthew Eng. Hi, Matthew. Hi, Mortada. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. I'm so excited to have you on the pod to talk about Blue Jasmine. Yes, there's a lot to say, I'm sure, about this performance <laughs> and also the film. Yeah, and this uh, what we want to talk about a little bit today is that when you look at the career of Kate Blanchett, there is, without a doubt, two movies that people agree are her top, mm-hmm. um, which is Blue Jasmine and Carol, and surprisingly, she did them right after each other mm-hmm. in 2013 and 2015. And, you know, sometimes, some days, I'm like, Blue Jasmine is her best performance. Some days, I'm like, Carol is her best performance. Okay. Um, I've just seen Blue Jasmine. I think it's her best performance, so I'm, this is the day <laughs> for that. But we also wanted to talk in this movie because... Unlike Carol, which has other elements that you can love, you can love other performances, you can love the cinematography, the writing, the direction. I think when you watch Blue Jasmine, it's about Kate's performance. Mm -hmm. And so um, for this episode, we're going to talk about the theory of like, can actors be auteurs? And this is a perfect movie for that. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? I definitely agree because... I really don't refer to Blue Jasmine as Woody Allen's anymore. I just sort of refer to it as Kate Blanchett's. Um, yeah, and that just feels accurate to me. It does feel accurate to me, too. So what is Blue Jasmine about? Blue Jasmine came out in July 2013. Mm-hmm. It was about a New York from IMDb, a New York socialite, deeply troubled and in denial, arrived in San Francisco to impose upon her sister. She looks like a million bucks but isn't bringing money, peace, or love. Okay, IMDb. Um, <laughs> Very judgmental. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Read Blue Jasmine for fucking film. Yeah, they are. So Blue Jasmine, always people talk about it as sort of a riff on a streetcar named Desire. Mm-hmm. So Jasmine, like Blanche Dubois, comes to visit her sister. There is a man in her past and men in her past, but mm-hmm. there is also men in her present who are making this visit um, terrible for her and for her sister. Yeah, so it's, yeah, I think of it as like a streetcar named Desire as filtered through the Bernie Madoff scandal, right? So there's, the Bernie Madoff scandal obviously involved this guy who had uh, done this Ponzi scheme where he cheated so many people out of millions of dollars um, and then, you know, was caught and suffered the consequences for it um, and then died. But... So it's interesting to think of, yeah, like what these two, what like this sort of tabloid friendly story Mm -hmm. would look like if it was reinterpreted in uh, the terms of, you know, one of the most classic plays of the American theater. Yep. And then put on film, obviously, starring one of our greatest actresses. Yeah. And I think that's where the screenplay pops, like that sort of bringing, Mm -hmm. it's obviously a retreat, despite Alan never admitting to that it's so obviously a retreat of blue of um streetcar but it also brings to your point that new off at the time that scandal was like in the news it had this movie was released a couple of years after that yeah um and everybody who sees it also saw the allusions to bernie madoff and to ruth madoff i have a theory that like woody has written all of his screenplays in the 70s and 80s and is just that's he just has been churning them out. Like he just like went on a writing spree for two decades because some I mean some of these screenplays are just so incredibly dated. Yes. And like they feel like they could only belong to a previous time where maybe these characterizations or maybe these scenarios would have been accepted. But I would say Blue Jasmine is like one of his more recent films that feels almost of its moment in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's touching on obviously this really notorious news story, but it's I think it belongs to its time in a way that you can't say for maybe 
any number of the, 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 the films yeah. he's made around that movie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you compare it to Wonder Wheel, Blue Jasmine feels very modern. Right, um, right, right. Uh, which is the movie that he did a couple of years after Blue Jasmine. But Kate appears immediately. So unlike The Aviator, where, where we had to wait almost half an hour for her to appear, or other movies where she's very briefly in them, Blue Jasmine is all about Kate Blanchett. So if you're yes. a Kate Blanchett fan, this is the movie you, you've probably already watched it seven times. But mm -hmm. if you haven't, this is the movie to watch. She immediately immediately appears right after the credits jabbering away to on a plane to a stranger telling her all about lovemaking and her life with her husband and why she left college and all kinds of stories that you feel are real but also are lies and sort of that scene immediately establishes the character. This is somebody who talks a lot. This is somebody who's very self-centered, who's narcissistic. Mm -hmm. And it also establishes that this is a performance that you're not mm -hmm. going to be able to take your eyes off. Yes. And it's interesting because it feels almost, I would say, since the Elizabeth movie is like her biggest showcase, mm -hmm. right? So it's, she's right there from the get-go and there's really nary a scene throughout the movie that doesn't spotlight her except for, you know, some extraneous Sally Hawkins, Bobby Cannavale mm -hmm. stuff. But yeah, so it feels like you're primed right from the get-go for like <laughs> full throttle Blanchett, which yeah. is exciting to see even though it feels sometimes like the film or the screenplay aren't entirely ready for just like the heightened intensity that she's bringing to this yeah. part in every interaction. Yeah, I mean, Kate is always somebody who's dominant on yes. screen. And yes. this is definitely the most dominant, even though the other actors are no slouches. Like Sally Hawkins plays her sister, Bobby Cannavale plays Sally Hawkins' boyfriend, mm -hmm. slash, so he's the Stanley in this scenario. Right. There is Andrew Dice Clay, who is Sally's ex-husband. Alec Baldwin is Kate's ex-husband. Mm -hmm. And Peter Sarsgaard is sort of like the Mitch, I guess, of if you're if we're looking at it in the streetcar cosmology. Of exactly. Kind of like, you know, the new suitor who she's, you know, pulling the wool over. Yeah, who um, might offer her salvation. Right, but then doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Mitch. Just like uh, Mitch. I could not believe, when I first saw this movie, you know, I was there opening night at the Angelica. Were um, you? Yes, that okay. Friday when it opened, I was there at the Angelica, the longest lines I've ever seen. It's just like from the very beginning, like we just like she holds the screens, and and I remember like there's three minutes in after she lands and she goes, um, mm -hmm. there's a cab driver who takes her to Sally's apartment, and Sally's not there, and there is, and he's like crowding her. And mm -hmm. Kate yeah. is trembling and just so overwhelmed. Jasmine is overwhelmed by the fact that she's there, but but uh, Sally is not there. What is happening? And she looks at the, at the cab driver and she's like, can I have some privacy while her whole body is shaking? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, this, I'm going to yeah. love this. This is a great performance. <laughs> this is a big performance. This is something, it's a whole body performance. It's a big performance. Like, she's not going to let go. This is not going to be some subtle work. Yeah. And I think you, what's interesting about that moment in particular, and my last viewing a couple of days ago, it definitely stuck out to me, where I feel like most of what he's writing is really noted for its economy. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I mean, they're not necessarily like the longest scenes. I mean, although he has written some very extended dialogue sequence scenes. But, yeah, this one, it's just like... It goes on much longer than you expect, and the camera's just sort of holding to her. And really what's happening is not major by any means. It's not driving the story forward, but we're just sort of... He's just, like, immersing us in this behavioral study of a woman clearly at her mm -hmm. wit's end. But, you know, in the most one of the most mundane circumstances, like, she can't find... Like, she needs to get into an apartment, mm -hmm. and she can't do that. And so, yeah, it's... Um, and, and that, even in that earliest scene you get I think I get the sense that Blanchett's performance is sort of even just like dictating Woody's own interest and in what he's going to capture in this film mm -hmm. like it's not going to just be you know snappy dialogue scenes between lovers or siblings or stuff like that it's going to be you know almost like an extended look at this one person yeah. one character yeah so she almost in a way, transforms it into a character portrait. Mm -hmm. With the force of the performance. Yes, 100%. And it's so... I mean, the theatricality of it, I think, just stands out mm -hmm. immediately. Where you, you, you understand, even, you know, as she's on that plane, just jabbering away, that 
we're watching a performer working in a very deliberately theatrical mm-hmm. register. So, you know, realism isn't the point of this performance. It's foregrounding a type of artifice that's going to be interesting to witness, especially in relation to these other performers who yeah. aren't necessarily, yeah, who are playing it kind of straight in a way. Yeah, who are not doing that same thing. So she's always going to stand out. And I love that you said that because this was the first big movie that Kate did after taking six years off mm-hmm. to run the Sydney Theatre Company and do a lot, lot of stage work. Yeah. And when she won the Oscar, she talked about how this is this performance is a synthesis of her work in on stage and in and on film. Yes, you can, and you can absolutely see that because it's important to note that she had played um, Blanche. Blanche Dubois in a production directed by Lee Woolman. Mm-hmm. I think maybe. I don't know what year it was exactly. But it was 2012, 20, no, actually before that, maybe 2008, eight, nine, something like that. Yeah. So in a, it's interesting to look at it, obviously, over the course of her career and how, like, you know, her extended time with the Sydney Theatre Company, but also her experience playing, you know, the character who is most directly responsible for Jasmine. Yeah. How that's <laughs> going to feed into this performance, but, you know, on a filmic level so that the... The outsidesness of it is sort of it needs to be reined in just like a little bit, just, even though she's not really reining it. In. She's not, but she's. It's a very controlled, yeah, performance. Like everything is controlled, and I think some of people who have a problem with this performance think of it as maybe too controlled because it's very calculated. Like she's always calculating the amount of pills or um, mm-hmm. booze that's in the system of Jasmine in every performance, calculating that. With external aids like um, sweat, like the way what like the mm. way her hair is oh is falling, God, yeah. like everything is yes. You look at her and you know, okay, Jasmine is drunk or Jasmine is high on Xanax mm-hmm. or Jasmine is whatever. But it is a very controlled performance while also being very emotional. Yeah, I think of. I mean, I think she brings such very like vivid emotional shadings to certain scenes in a way that elevates their me or even works against maybe what Alan had intended where you get I think of the scene where she it's a flashback and it's important to note if you haven't seen Blue Jasmine although you're probably not listening to this podcast <laughs> yeah. if you haven't seen Blue Jasmine big spoilers coming so um, if you haven't seen stop it's on Netflix go watch it come back <laughs> um the scene where it's one of the flashback scenes where uh she's sort of interrogating Alec Baldwin about, I think this, one of their, one of his many mistresses. Yes. But she's asking if this woman is his mistress or Mm -hmm. if he's having an affair with her. And the, the way that her questioning, she's so intense about Mm -hmm. about it, obviously. And all she's doing is really like taking off her earrings on the bed. Mm -hmm. But her face is intense and her whole body's tense. Yeah. And so like the, but like her laser like intensity in that scene just sort of, once he denies it, just sort of slides into this like very, almost like, I don't know, like a, as if a weight like has an been lifted. Ardor. Yeah. No, like she's like so hot for him in that moment. Like she, it's like this possessive lust. And yeah. it's like, of course not. What on earth makes you think that? Well, someone made a remark. What remark? They saw you having lunch with her. You're taking her hand. Oh, what crap. Who told you that? I know who. It was that vacuous troublemaker, Lydia. Am I right? Were you? It had to be Lydia, because I was having a business lunch with Amy at the Four Seasons. Did and you Lydia was there. take her hand? Are you nuts? You think if I was having an affair, I'd be crazy enough to have it in public at the Four Seasons? Well, I don't know. Sometimes you drink at lunch. You know, maybe you're high. I mean, it's obvious she's got a crush on you. Honey, you're building a case. Because if you were having an affair, I would be pretty upset. Well, I'm not, so don't get your temper up. I don't like that side of you. I'm just jealous because I love you. You should be flattered. I mean, this pa- I think the entire, this last viewing of Blue Jasmine, I really, the flashbacks really stood out to me as like this very credible portrait of a marriage. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, obviously Blanchett's contribution. But I think, I mean, I think Alec Baldwin knows well enough to just... That he doesn't need to do much in those scenes because yes. Blanchett is really telegraphing and telegraphing all that needs to be communicated so mm-hmm. he can just sort of underplay in a way that's, I think, productive for those scenes. Complimentary. But yeah, he's a perfect compliment for her. Mm-hmm. All he has to do is just sort of kind of sidestep her and, you know. But yeah, the way that she that scene just sort of slides from an interrogation into a seduction is, you know, it's very, I mean, it's breathtaking to behold because... 
I think you just see how quicksilver her emotions are and mm-hmm. it gives that that relationship more credibility than I think maybe yeah. exists on the page. Yeah. And this is also, you know, it, it's sort of back to, um, and if you want to talk also about building a relationship with Sally Hawkins as her sister, like some of the press that came out around that time is that they both talked about how Woody doesn't rehearse, he doesn't mm-hmm. give feedback. Kate talked about how he told her after her first few days on set that she was awful and that she needs to do Did it again. Really? I don't think I heard that story. <laughs> It is. There is a video um, in an interview she did in, during her Oscar campaign to the New York Times, and where he she says that he told her you're awful, but he didn't give her any feedback what was awful or what to do, and and then the reporter would ask her, and then so what happened? And she was like, well, I guess it got less awful because he didn't say that again. <laughs> I had I had never heard that story. I think of there's a story of him telling him bringing Diane Weaston during Bullets Over Broadway to watch the dailies. Mm-hmm. Um, because she she admitted to that she just wasn't getting the voice down for that character. Mm-hmm. And he just brought her in to watch it. And he was like, do you hear what I hear? Or something like that. And she was like, yeah, I'll, I'll fix it. And I mean, obviously we get one of the greatest comedic performances yeah. of all time as a result. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, because I feel like, especially latter day, Alan every actor who's worked with him seems to just say like, yeah, I mean, he's pretty flexible. He's pretty easygoing. He'll just, you know, if you want another take, he's fine with it. But like, you know, he's not, he doesn't really give a shit if, if it needs to be done or not. Yeah. And one of the things that Sally Hawkins also talked about in interviews is that Kate was on stage in New York doing Uncle Vanya Uh before they shot. And she came to New York and they would do fittings with the costume designer, Uh Susie Bendiger, who's an amazing doll in this movie. And that's where they rehearsed. That's where they talked to each other. That's when they built the the history of the sister. She's like, there was nothing in the screenplay about it except the few things that are, that we see is like they were adopted. Obviously, Jasmine was favored by the mother. And Uh she's like, so they built the history together, just talking to each other about what happened, why did Ginger leave, Mm -hmm. what was the relationship with the parents. And so this is also sort of feeds into the theory that we have about this, the actors, the auteur. They filled in the gaps in that that relationship relationship with it which is the central relationship in this movie mm-hmm. even though it is kind of a bit lopsided because the movie is really about just jasmine yeah <laughs> can i make a confession sure i don't love sally hawkins in this movie <laughs> and i think sally i usually love sally hawkins i mm-hmm. think she's brilliant i think she's generally underrated but i don't something about this performance just doesn't work for I don't it's and it's not just the the very almost like alien New York accent that <laughs> just doesn't it's just that you know it sounds like it's like the cadences just are weird and yeah but I think it's almost it could be that Kate is working on such a heightened level mm-hmm. that Sally Hawkins isn't I think Sally Hawkins like Baldwin maybe just wanted to it's you know underplaying and stay out of the way. Yeah. And stay out of the way of the hurricane. <laughs> stay out of, yeah, exactly. And I think like her best moments are her just sort of looking at Jasmine and confusion what? or horror. But I, I What find, is going on, Jasmine? Yes, she has a few of those. Yeah. But I find the solo scenes of her, you know, pursuing when she's in relationship with Bobby Cannavale and then later with Louis C.K. Ugh. Just, I don't, something is just not clicking for me. And I think also one of my main quibbles with the movie overall, which I guess is a flawed move with a, an extraordinary performance that, you know, gives it a reason for being. Um, but one of my, I feel like one of my quibbles is that I just never buy the backstory as written. Mm. Because I think the backstory, the scant details that we get imply that they were both adopted, mm-hmm. Jasmine and Ginger. Yes. And I think it, they're from upstate New York or something like that. I don't, I don't think it's clear. Yeah. I don't, and so something, and that, you know, obviously Jasmine was favored, and then Ginger Ginger ran away? One of them ran away? Yeah, she ran away, Ginger did. So something about the backstory, I never believe it when I'm watching Sally Hawkins, and I don't necessarily believe it when I'm watching Kate either, but it's almost besides the point when I'm watching Kate, because it's so, there's just so much else going on, Mm -hmm. and I feel like Sally Hawkins is generally playing it as straight as she can mm-hmm. but there's nothing that I almost pops. wish she would experiment more yeah. with that character and you know, or attempt to take it to the register that Kate's performing in 
just because I, I think the backstory just doesn't benefit them. And, this, you know, the I don't believe her as, like, Andrew Dice Clay's wife. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's a very hard sell on that one. I thought that she, like, we, we talked about how the screenplay is uneven. Mm-hmm. And I think she suffers from the fact that her scenes are... For some reason, just not written as not written as well. Like the whole relationship with Louis C.K. is kind of comes out of nowhere and goes out of nowhere, and sort of is becomes a big thing, and then is resolved immediately. And even the whole thing with Bobby Cannavale is not really. Um, like I, I hope they had showed me more. I wish they had showed me mm-hmm. uh, more fire because that's like. Bobby Cannavale is playing Stanley. He's giving him the fire, the sex appeal, the like big emotions, the crying, the everything. But it's just like all of that for Ginger. Like I, I didn't get it. (laughs) (laughs) We love Sally Hawkins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in that context for sure. Yeah, but also, and I think it's just that Woody isn't really. I wouldn't say he's even throughout the screenplay really building these characters so much as just putting them in new scenarios that they react to mm-hmm. emotionally. Like, I don't think... These characters aren't really, like, transforming moment to moment. And I think that's especially true of Ginger. And so I think I think Sally Hawkins suffers for that, that, mm-hmm. like, lack of interest in, like, you know, her character's psychology or interiority. But whereas, like, you know, Woody is more than fine, you know, instead of building character for Jasmine, like, why not just have her pop a few pills and that'll be enough detail <laughs> for, to, you know, to hold the film through. Yeah. Like, but Kate Blanchett is making it these, like, little details that are, you know, Woody just, like, these shortcuts that he's in of his screenplay, I mm. think are really actually what are you, the fuel for Kate's performance. Mm-hmm. They're, I mean, they're giving her... A, Give like, me an example of these shortcuts. I just, I can't, I feel like there's so, there could be so much more to Jasmine beyond just the pill popping and mm-hmm. the the alcohol guzzling. I think it's, you know, it, in a way we've seen that in Woody's films, right? I mean, mm-hmm. anyone who's watched, a, you know, Husbands and Wives or even, you know, Geraldine Page and in Interiors, yeah. like, familiar, or have, are familiar with these, like, you know, mad women, these everyday mad women yeah. uh, who are going under. And it doesn't feel like he's elevating his interest in these women, mm-hmm. but I think it's they're reliant upon the, the talents of an actress like Kate Blanchett or an actress like Judy Davis or Geraldine Page, who can bring more, you know, animation to it, so that we believe it even in spite of the script shortcomings. Yeah, and he just gets out of the way. Yes, and which is important. And he does get out of Kate's way in this movie a lot. Some of the shot compositions, like. The, the whole scenes that are set in the Hamptons, I was watching these yesterday. I'm like, why is the camera there? And like, it's the, it's a whole long scene that just plays in one setting when there are like multiple characters, but there are some characters you whose faces you never see because they're, he's just shooting from behind. I'm like, oh, he's just putting the camera on Kate mm-hmm. for this whole long scene. And I guess he didn't do coverage or he just decided not to use it. Mm -hmm. because the force of Kate's performance is just like he's entrapped as the audience is just wanting to watch her even when Mm -hmm. she is not active in the scene. And I think that force I think that force can almost become a liability in the movie in relation to Alan's direction specifically because I'm thinking now of the scene in which Jasmine comes back to Ginger's apartment for the last time. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's the this, it's this second to last scene of the movie. Mm-hmm. She's just been dumped by Peter Sarsgaard and she she's is, mid-breakdown. Her, her stepson has discovered the betrayal that she's, mm-hmm. you know, uh, wielded on her his now dead father. And she comes home and she's... It's, you know, it's her rock bottom. She's, her hair is matted to her face. She's so sweaty. is running. (laughs) She's stammering, stumbling. And, you know, because it's Cate Blanchett and she's just this Amazonian figure, like, all of these characteristics just are so much more heightened because, I mean, her height alone is, you know, so striking Mm -hmm. and so overwhelming. But, you know, so she's this unignorable figure in the shot compositions or even like when, as she's just entering a frame and so she enters the scene looking like this with like her mascara running and her hair matted and Bobby Cannavale and Sally Hawkins are just on the couch acting like nothing has changed <laughs> they haven't they don't there's, see what we see there's, yeah and it's just in a way there's just like no connection to 
reality. Reality? <laughs> yeah. It's almost like Alan isn't ready, isn't as observant as maybe he should have been to the the intensity that Kate is bringing just by, even just an appearance alone, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It's, she's definitely intense in every single scene. I do want to go back to Sally Hawkins for just a second and yes. say that one of my most favorite movie, uh, my most favorite bits in this whole movie is when she meets Alec Baldwin for the first time in the flashback to New York and she curtsies, which oh, is yes, such I a cute little moment. And it's sort of that moment. I wish to your point earlier that she was going full throttle. I think this is a moment where she's not going full throttle, but she is giving a sort of unique characteristic of Ginger is that yeah. she's so just overwhelmed by this big, powerful man that mm-hmm. she, she thinks of him as some sort of king. <laughs> that is a good one. Yeah, that's a great detail. One scene that I really like, and I think everyone is performing well in, but I mean, obviously, especially Kate. It's when Jasmine, when Ginger first introduces Jasmine to Chili. Mm, and he brings a he friend. He brings his friend, played yeah. by Max Casella. And it's just, it's a long scene. It goes on very long. And it's, I mean, we're, I, I don't think we're being really filled into many new details about Jasmine's past, mm-hmm. but just the sheer discomfort that Kate is telegraphing mm-hmm. through that makes it excruciating Mm -hmm. but in a way that's I mean I I think it's you know whereas it would have just been this kind of you know broadly comedic scene scene or meeting of opposites it becomes really just a kind of an endurance test in which we're watching we're seeing if this woman this character can withstand a lunch with her sister's boyfriend and this guy that has been foolishly all these people she doesn't like Yes, and yeah. it's and it also shows us like she she is so in her head in that scene. She's an island, like she is with these other three people in the scene. But Jasmine is an island in that scene because mm-hmm. while she is, she would sometimes say something in response to whatever they're saying to her. The performance shows us that Jasmine is just in her head in that mm-hmm. scene. Even it's in the screenplay, obviously, because there are things that we need where she just stares into the distance and they're sort of like yeah. asking her about that and calling her out of that. But for the most part, they don't notice what yeah. an island she is and how she's not with them, really. Yeah. One thing I love about the performance is almost how class conscious her gaze is. Mm. I noticed this time around that she never seems to hold eye contact with either with Sally Hawkins or Bobby Cannavale. Like she does that thing where she can be looking directly at them. Mm. But there's no life oh, underneath yeah. the eyes. You know, mm. it's just she's just enduring this conversation, or her mind is just completely elsewhere mm-hmm. in a you know a past that won't stop bothering her. But in her scenes with um with Alec Baldwin and Peter Sarsgaard, I think that's the only time we really see Blanchett sustaining mm-hmm. eye contact with the scene partner. But I think that even deepens the characterization so that we understand Jasmine as a character who really only blooms under mm-hmm. the under the the gaze of these wealthy powerful men who mm-hmm. she feels some sense of protection from or just like they're worth her time yeah 100% <laughs> of course <laughs> what i love also about this performance is all the bits when Kate as Jasmine will just stop mm-hmm. and either stare into the distance. I or... saw you, Erica. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> or just when she's with Peter Sarsgaard and like she's telling all these lies, but she stops like before the lie comes out uh-huh. of her as if she's thinking what the lie should be. Mm-hmm. Like after she says New York Park Avenue, she stops a little bit. That's not a lie. But then she has to lie about her husband and she says he's a surgeon. Mm-hmm. When, you know, he's not. So so it shows us, like, oh, Jasmine is thinking about these lies. And she's not a very good liar, even mm-hmm. though, you know, Dwight is just so clueless that he takes in I everything. Mean, just to, He seems like a completely naive idiot in a way. Yeah. I mean, a handsome idiot because he's Peter Sarsgaard. But he's Mitch. Mitch is like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> but almost like wanting... I mean, who wouldn't want to be seduced by Kate Blanchett, right, at that yeah. point? But... One of the things I love is almost like how perfectly timed her the, her gaze will be to the flashback. Like mm. you'll see, like her her eyes going foggy, and it's right to. I mean, it's a, really a tribute to the editing, but I think she 
I mean, she's obviously familiar with the script, so she knows, like, when these flashbacks will occur. Mm -hmm. She knows when Jasmine's mind is going elsewhere. Um, And she gives it, but she gives those flashbacks a kind of sense. I mean, you know, we see the character in the midst of remembering, as opposed to these flashbacks just happening, you know, willy-nilly. They're given a sort of tangible, you know, they reasoning become, in the movie. They become, in the performance, rather. Yeah, and they become... Like, when you, when you go, you just feel it. It's It becomes very sort of emotionally monumentous yes. when they cut to the flashback. You yeah. know something's about to happen. And, you know, you're mentioning the editing. It made me think a little bit about, like, did she give the editor lots of choices? <laughs> because, you know, Woody is known for not taking many takes, but yeah. it's, it's like that precision in... Like, definitely this performance is like a go-all-out broke. She's sweaty. She's big and yeah. you know it needs a little bit of control from the editor so but i think she's she's giving at least from what we can see in the finished product like there mm-hmm. seem to be these cues to an editor or you know that are aligned with the screenplay's yeah. structure where we see her amidst uh you know a moment of remembrance so that it and as, I mean, there are some flashbacks where it's just like, well, is she really thinking about that right now? Like, it's just like Woody wanting to get these expository dialogue scenes out of the way so that we understand the characters later mm-hmm. on. But I think she gives it a kind of reasoning just through the transparency of of what she's doing. Yeah. We're talking about the screenplay. This movie is full of amazing one-liners. And yes. I don't know who gets the credit here because obviously they pop off and Woody's known for writing ama- good mm-hmm. dialogue. Yes. But it's just Blanchett's delivery. It's like, I can hear these things. I saw you, Erica, which you just mentioned. That whole thing is just like, that whole story she tells is just so memorable. And the punchline of I saw you, Erica, is just like something I hear all the time. Just yeah. the delivery of it. I think that's the one scene. If I really want to be, if I'm really trying to procrastinate, I think that's like the one scene from Blue Jasmine. I'll go back and just watch. I think because it's on YouTube or something. Yeah, it so, is. Yeah. But there, yeah, there's just something so entrancing mm-hmm. and kind of nerve wracking about yeah. watching her just recount this story that brings up all of this, this sudden vitriolic. Yeah. You know, a statement. And she goes, like, it started as a nice moment. She's just reconnecting with her sister. And then at, by the end of it, she, like, hates the whole world. And she looks strung yeah. out. And yeah. it's like, and to the, you know, Ginger then is just like, are you okay? And I was feeling that, too. It's like, are you okay? Yeah. And I think even there, you see, like, it doesn't feel like spiritually, like, Blanchett is in the room. Or that Jasmine is in the room, rather. Like, Blanch- whatever Blanchett is doing... She just seems to be, like, receding so that her entire interiority is just consumed with the past. She's mm-hmm. not even she's not even looking at Sally Hawkins in that scene. And, you know, it's Sally Hawkins is the one who sort of has to zap her out of this yeah. trance that she's put herself in. Yeah. But I think it's the film is more interesting in a way for instances like that where Kate is choosing not to interact with Sally Hawkins or she's, yeah. you know, keeping herself at this purposeful remove that Mm -hmm. you know is powerful to watch but also i think speaks volumes about the relationship between jasmine and ginger who Mm -hmm. aren't people that really connect yeah at the end of the day i want to go back to school i want to get my degree and become you know something substantial i can't just do some mindless job i was forced to take a job selling shoes on madison avenue oh so humiliating. Friends I'd had at dinner parties, our apartment came in and I waited on them. I mean, do you have any idea what that's like? No, one minute you're hosting women and the next you're measuring their shoe size and fitting them. Erica Bishop came into the store. She saw me, was so embarrassed for me. She slipped out thinking I didn't see her. I saw you, Erica. You okay? Another scene also that's full of these zingers and these one-liners is where she's babysitting the two children <laughs> at Chuck E. Cheese. And that scene has should Which not one? work. It yeah. should not work. Like, it's so <laughs> extraneous. It's just about her telling, telling us, basically, I think Woody didn't, couldn't find a way to 
to get us to the next bit of the story. So he's like, oh, let's just have a scene where she tells us what happened. Yeah. And it should not work. But it works because she's she's like she has the big line about you know anxiety and nightmares and a nervous breakdown Mm -hmm. and then the one about tip big boys it's like it's like there's so many one-liners and you're just watching her and also she starts to see she's just um happy go lucky she's happy dwight is in her life she's enjoying her night out with these kids that she obviously doesn't like because she doesn't like anybody um, and then by the end of it, she's also in another trance and she's just like talking about anxiety and nightmares. And you're like, oh my God, she is in a nightmare right now. Yeah. I would say that's one of the scenes in Blue Jasmine that were truly beggars belief. It almost seems like those kids are just not on the same set. No. Yeah. Them. Probably and, weren't. And you don't, it's like supposed to be a Chuck E. Cheese, but if, there's nothing telling about it being a Chuck E. It's just it's like just some, a diner. It's yeah. just some diner that <laughs> would let Woody Allen shoot as, you know, a scene there. But um, yeah, even the transition in that scene is, is crazy. As you said, I mean, it begins as her, you know, clearly tipsy and very, you know, blight and, you know, in jovial spirits. And then almost the way like her body is contorting so that she's just sort of like hunchbacked mm, by the end and of like it, yeah. very you know grim faced is i mean it's, it makes you want to call child services is what it makes you want to do but <laughs> but it's it's yeah it's it's fascinating to behold even though it makes no sense within the context of the story why this character would be telling the boy the these boys young this. boys this story yeah, yeah. and so because her performance is so overwhelming and just so, in, you know, rendered in bold face from top to bottom, it's these almost like psychological inconsistencies don't, re- you're not concerned with them. Yeah, because you're just so entrapped by the performance. Yes. And you're just deep in watching this amazing actor just turn this scene that, you know, I already said this, but I'm going to, it bears repeating. Yeah. Should not work. Yeah. It, and, Somebody, you know, when you were editing this movie, you, you you come upon this scene and you're like, oh, we don't need that. But just the performance is so amazing that then it becomes, when I first saw this movie, that was the scene for me. Yeah. That was like, oh, this is her Oscar clip. This is the scene where she sealed that Oscar win. You know, looking back now, it's the whole performance. There are so many other scenes where she's better. But it is a scene maybe because... Um, the writing isn't as sharp, but the performance is sharper because she yeah. needed to make the writing better. And so I think it's really maybe just a great summation of the of the of the performance as a whole, which is you know making these irresolvable contradictions in in Woody Allen's writing mm-hmm. in his conception of these characters. It's are just part of this specific human being. Mm-hmm. I think that Kate Blanchett makes us believe they belong to Jasmine, whereas an actress who, you know, a lesser actress, yes. as, all, as most <laughs> actresses are in, <laughs> compared to Kate Blanchett, but, uh, you know, w- might not be able to manage. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the big thing about this movie. Like, I can't imagine somebody else doing it, and I think if somebody else had played this, I don't think we would be talking about it seven years later. I mean, I can maybe only imagine, like, Judy Davis, circa Husbands and Wives. I mean, that's really the performance that this character is indebted Mm -hmm. to. Um, And one of the great, great performances in Woody Allen's filmography. And Kate, you know, as a fellow Australian, has always been in sort of the Judy Davis Mm -hmm. school of acting. Yes. Yes. So they're... They have a similar sort of just, like, going for broke and while being so entertaining and heartbreaking and big and everything. Yeah, well, I think they're both actors who aren't afraid to be caught acting, you know? Mm, Yeah, oh, that's a great way of putting it. You know, so that, I mean, and what's great about Jasmine as played by Kate is that I think of the scene where she's in Ginger's apartment and she's awaiting uh, Peter Sarsgaard's phone call. Mm. All this chaos. I think it's when uh, Bobby Cannavale He comes in in and he's like, yeah, asking Ginger about going out to a date with Louis C.K. Yeah, I mean, there's he, a whole bunch of things happening. He's flinging her like across the room. He's like breaking a lamp, and all Kate and can focus on is getting this phone call. And but once she does, once the phone does ring, mm-hmm. I just love the way that she she has to sit down mm-hmm. and she has to sort of just compose herself. And then even when she picks up the phone, is on the phone call, like she's timing it. You know, she's, she puts the phone down for a second and, you know, just 
waits what, what waits like a certain amount of time that she thinks is like an appropriate amount of time Before for she, someone yeah. like to give the impression that she is busy. Yeah. But in, in scenes like that, you really understand that oh oh being Jasmine is a performance, mm. you know. Yeah. And and going back to the backstory of it, like I think it's interesting. I mean, I can't again. I can't imagine. Kate Blanchett ever having lived the life as described by Alan or being like an anthropology student at Boston <laughs> University. I mean, that really, that stretches belief even that's, by, that's... by Woody Allen's standards. Yeah. But in a moment like that, I think, because we're still watching Blanchett fabricate a performance and because we're watching a character whose life is a performance, mm-hmm. we, I mean, there's so much that we don't, that we can't even imagine about Jasmine that's not even explained about the character. Like, mm-hmm. how did she... How did she get into this world where she might meet a man like Alec Baldwin yeah. and become his wife? Like The what? only clue is that she changed her name from Jeanette to right. Jasmine. That's it. Yeah. Like, how did she get to the party where she heard Blue Moon and she, they fell in love? I think you do understand that the character could do this because we see Blanchett sort of just... Doing it. We're just she, doing it. She's doing it. She, it's the, she forces you to be convinced. She foregrounds the process of mm-hmm. putting together a character so that we understand Jasmine as someone who has, you know, essentially put herself together. Yeah. Like an actress playing a character. Yeah. yeah. And, and this performance is a performance of building blocks. Yeah. For instance, when she played Catherine Harper, and that was also a performance where she built blocks, you know, uh-huh. it's like the hair and then the voice, then the body. This is also a performance of that. But I think it's deeper than that. So she is emotionally building blocks. So mm-hmm. it's a crescendo, right? So at the beginning, when, when she's, we start with her in San Francisco, she's trying this new life. There is mm-hmm. maybe a little bit of hope. And then, you know, it, it keeps building and, so, and and at the beginning it's going towards like oh this is going to resolve nicely with Dwight but then it takes a swerve and and it's as if all that she built is then it's you just reach the top of the bo- volcano and then the revelations happen and mm-hmm. you see the revelations happening twice in San Francisco and in New York mm-hmm. and that's where everything just blows up it's it completely blows up I love you know how in the f- performance become it's always a physical performance but it becomes very physical in very two distinct scenes one where after Dwight finds out all her lies and she's getting out of the car and everything falls out of her bag and she has to pick it up Mm -hmm. and that is you know you get it again with Alec Baldwin after he tells her he's fallen in love with Lizette Mm -hmm. Boudreau what a name Um, (laughs) and then everything also everything also why is she carrying all these things in her handbag but anyway (laughs) everything in her handbag also falls out on the couch and she has to try she's looking Mm -hmm. for the Xanax or whatever she's looking and those two scenes you know they're the zenith of like this is Jasmine's bottom Mm -hmm. and it's the sort of intelligence of the performance that you that she shows us those two things are as two bookends Mm -hmm. and similar emotionally even though she is a different place in her life yeah and I think it's interesting that you know even though her style is is so exaggerated in the at that point Mm -hmm. as is the performance mostly on the whole it's still devastating to witness it's still incredibly alarming and Mm -hmm. I think just throughout the movie there's Lynn Chatfield's this sort of terror in the audience you mm-hmm. know where we're wondering like is this going to be the scene in which she just flatlines completely mm-hmm. and just you know self-annihilates i thought she was going to commit suicide everything that follows the phone call to the fbi and this the the purse scene where she jumps out mm-hmm. of peter sarsgaard's car you know those are the climaxes and everything after that is just sort of like the shell-shocked effect of it I feel like the ending specifically, I'm never, I'm completely unable to imagine Jasmine lifting herself off that bench at the end. You That's know? it. She's going to be on that bench until <laughs> she croaks and dies. Yeah. But, yeah. And it just feels like it, the film could only end there in a way, just because mm. any future seems unimaginable. I yeah. mean, it almost seems like she's renounced any possible future for herself. So, and it's like, you know, there's this sort of unconscious embrace of her own insanity and in Mm. that way it's a kind of death you know it is i mean we don't even need to see the character commit suicide because really any future is just she's foreclosed any any glimpse of a future yeah that bench is her coffin yeah 100 percent
you know, if we're talking about, you know, Kate is the auteur of this movie, Woody Allen definitely let her down with that whole computer subplot thing. Because what world do we live in in 2012-13 when this movie was shot and released that somebody needs to go to class to learn how to use a computer? <laughs> well, that's what, I, and that's one of the reasons why I believe this screenplay was written in 1984 or something. You know, Probably, like, yes. I mean, it, in a way, you can imagine a character as just hopeless as Jasmine mm-hmm. needing to go to one of those classes. Yeah. Again, just because Kate Blanchett looks like Kate Blanchett. I can't possibly imagine her ever touching a a computer screen (laughs) or, you know, in a class with that many normal looking people. But, you know, it's, so it's, there's that scene where she's talking to the, the friend that she makes in that class who invites Mm -hmm. her to the party where she eventually meets Peter Sarsgaard's character. I I can't suspend my disbelief in that scene. Mm -hmm. And yet it's, it's almost just like a, like this odd survey of like, what if we put Kate Blanchett in, in a computer class and, and Will just it work? go wild, <laughs> yeah. to evoke Jenna Rollins and, and, you know, at her most untethered. Yeah. I mean, it works if you think that, you know, Jasmine is always self-sabotaging. Mm-hmm. So I think of it as like, oh, I, to, for me to be able to have any job or career, I need to study this thing, but let me make this thing very hard for me. Um, so I can't actually get to have a career. So it's another way of her self-sabotaging, similar to calling the FBI on Hal, similar mm-hmm. to the lies she tells Dwight, similar to all the things that she does in the movie to self-sabotage. It's giving herself another roadblock that maybe she can't recover from. Yeah. That's the only way that it's believable. <laughs> or even, I think it kind of speaks to maybe dubious um, inclination that Woody Allen has where he wants us to sort of laugh at these well-to-do woman who's Mm. clearly suffering from some serious mental issues and just put her in these debased circumstances like i can't the whole dentist subplot too is just yes yeah i mean it's it's it works a bit more than the computer class but just is she wearing scrubs at one point or something she is yeah or it's just yeah it's just you can't wrap your head around it I mean, it is. it shows us, you know, she works for a sexual predator, and it sort right. of shows us, like, you know, somebody who looks like that, you know, maybe would would um, attract that sort of man. But I don't know. Like, it's it sort of, it's a contained subplot that doesn't sort of feed into the rest of the story, so it is a little odd. Yeah, it just feels like Woody kind of grasping at straws, but she also makes it work, yeah. because, I mean, just her complete ineptitude in these... In these jobs is, is hilarious to watch. It's very funny. I think that's where she is the funniest. Yeah. Because at, sometimes she is funny with all those one-liners, but you're just afraid to laugh because you she might completely melt down in the next scene. Yeah. <laughs> like what? Like any inclination to laugh, you worry could you know precede a potential suicide attempt or something like that. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's alarming. She's so dominant in this movie. Who do you think she had the best scenes with? You talked earlier about Alec Baldwin. Is that who you think she had the best scenes with? I think those are the most believable scenes, I would say. I like that he's underplaying again. Mm -hmm. I like that he's just ceding the stage to her. And I just believe him as that character 100%. Mm. So that, you know, I can focus on... You know, I mean, I'm always focusing on Kate Blanchett, but yeah. in those scenes you in particular... You can not in this movie. <laughs> I think because he's so restrained, it gives her a lot of flexibility to just sort of manipulate the the course of those scenes as she pleases, to vivify them with unexpected emotions. So yeah, I, those are definitely my favorite scenes. But what would you say? Who do you think she has um, the best scenes with? I sort of like, I enjoyed Bobby Cannavale. The, the movie's not interested in any relationship. Um, between them because that's the one thing that's different from from streetcar right it's like there's no sexual chemistry between them whatsoever Mm -hmm. but i do like the scene where he's trying clumsily to find out how long she's gonna stay at ginger's and at the same time he's trying to tell her that his friend wants her her phone number which is completely unbelievable because that is yes another (laughs) like has he not has he not looked at her once during this entire lunch? It makes no sense why he would ask for her phone number. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the tension between the characters, to me, was palpable. And that's, I think maybe he is 
he's definitely, nobody's playing at Kate's level in this movie, but I think in that scene, just because there's so much tension, un unsaid tension between them, I thought he came closest. Yeah, I think a stronger version of this movie might have explored that dynamic further. Because, mm. yeah, it is, I mean, that is obvious. It's one of the fundamental, it is the fundamental dynamic in Street Cranium Desire. So it's odd that it just kind of gets, you know, short shrifted here. Mm -hmm. This is playing on the vineyard. Blue moon. I used to know the words. I know the words. No, they're all a jumble. The movie starts with her telling the story of Blue Moon and ends with it telling the story of Blue Moon. I don't know that there is anything more to mention, but I just thought that that was very poignant in that when she talks about Blue Moon at the beginning, she's telling a happy story. Mm -hmm. And when at the end, she's telling the same story, basically. Just the performance is different and the way she tells it is, is very sad and heartbreaking. And I think that's sort of, that's the journey that we've been in. Mm -hmm. And this movie's a bummer of an ending and just, mm -hmm. just that it ends with that story. I give credit to the writing, but I also give credit to just the performance of that. Makes... You end the movie, um, even though nobody likes Jasmine, right? Like, she's not somebody you like or want to be around at all. Mm -hmm. But the, the way that she tells those two stories, the same story differently, it just breaks my heart. Yeah, and I mean, it's easy to take for granted just how believable she is. I mean, we hear it on the soundtrack, Blue Moon, mm -hmm. but I'm sure when she was filming it, it wasn't playing. Yeah. And yet, you never for one second doubt that this character is hearing it, mm -hmm. you know, unfold as she's relaying the story yeah. um which is just a credit to you know this exceptionally physicalized performance yeah. where you know it's it she strikes with this fascinating balance between you know being in a scene because so much of the character's action is storytelling or you know weaving this fiction or mm -hmm. weaving this uh fantasy of a life she once led but you know while also having one foot in the pa in that same past so that she you know She's she's always there, but she still has to maintain a presence in the in her present. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's I just find that balance really fascinating, and it's it's something that Kate, you know, makes possible for the character, and it's something that even you you couldn't necessarily say exists at the level of the script because mm -hmm. it's it's almost like its own special effect in mm -hmm. a way. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a great way of putting it. Okay, now let's end on a fun, positive note, because the ending <laughs> is such a bummer. Have you, in real life, ever said any of the many zingers and one-liners that Kate says in Blue Jasmine? Do you mean, like, quoting it? Or like, yeah, like, like, I have said, I saw you, Erica, time. Oh, yes, me too. I've said, <laughs> I've said that many times when, you know, when I'm questioning people who are, like, you know, telling a little bit of a line. I'm like, I saw you, Erica. <laughs> yeah, that's... I would say that's the one line I remember most vividly from this movie. And it's all in, del in the delivery. Yeah. You know. Because I mean, it's not, like, I saw you, Eric, it's not that interesting or memorable, but it's the way it's delivered. And because she's, you know, screaming at it full blast, yeah. it's it's pretty iconic. But I, what's the other line that she has that's really... Um, who do you have to sleep with yes, around here no. to get a stolen martini with a twist of lemon? Maybe I'll start incorporating that into my <laughs> daily conversation. Just, so, you know, at work, uh, at home, you know. Yeah. That's a good one. So we're talking about, you know, in this episode of Sundays We Skate about Kate Blanchett as an auteur of Blue Jasmine. And you have written about Juliette Binoche mm -hmm. as an auteur. Can you tell us um, what movie and what did you find out with Juliette? Yeah, well, I wrote about Binoche for the, the symposium uh, that the site reverse shot did uh, this past summer, um, which was essentially looking a career long mm -hmm. look at uh, Benoche's performance with the theory of Benoche as the auteur of her performances and of her films in a way in mind. Mm -hmm. um, so I looked at Cachet. And that um, movie sort of like, it's not like a Juliette Binoche dominant movie because it's a two hander with Daniel, Daniel Etoy. Yeah. But what I noticed on as I was writing this piece was that. 
I think you need actresses of Binoche's stature in a role like that. Or an actress... I think... Also, it's just because Juliette Binoche is a maximalist actress, you know? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Almost in the same way as Kate Blanchett and Blue Jasmine is that she's more inclined to play something to the hilt mm-hmm. than okay. she is yep. to rein it in mm-hmm. or to, you know, uh, underplay yeah. a line or a scene. Um, you've also written a series about Meryl Streep, who's another actor who's an auteur, because a Meryl movie is a Meryl movie. You almost never think of the director. At least I don't. I think of Meryl. <laughs> I don't I think, think she of... does either. Yeah. So. so, you know, you have basically saw every single movie Meryl has made yes, and written about all of them, right? <laughs> so is there, tell us just one example of this theory, a movie where you felt that what she was doing as the auteur of that film really worked and made the movie better. Which, a movie is always better with Meryl, but yes. what's the best example of that? I don't know if it's the best example, but the one that sprang quickest to mind is The Post. Mm, and that's a recent one, yeah. Yeah, but what I really think about when I think about that movie is I think of her on the phone. Just the the gradations of her ambivalence mm-hmm. in, the, in that scene, you know, it's... it's it, I think she almost makes that decision, like, the, uh, the climax of the movie. Mm-hmm. Within maybe what is a few minutes, you get just like the tiniest flickers of, you know, a, a woman making a in, decision making a decision that mm-hmm. she knows will, you know, determine the entire course of her yeah. life. And I think M- Meryl communicates that yeah. to the max. And it's mm-hmm. not even that she's overplaying it, but she finds a way to make it seismic. transparent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to make it seismic. Exactly. Yeah. Legends all. Binoche, Street, mm. Blanchett. But let's go back to Kate. I want to ask you a few questions about Kate because we always do this on Sundays with Kate. Please. please do you do. remember the first time you saw Kate? What movie was it? This isn't ex- def- This isn't the first time I saw Kate. I think probably the first time I saw Kate was maybe Lord of the Rings or mm, yeah. even honestly Indiana Jones. Um, <laughs> just because I was young at the time. Uh, yeah. But the first time I re- I would say I really saw Kate was um, okay. So when Notes on a Scandal came out, I was mm. I was thirteen. Oh wow. Um, so I couldn't. I and I was obviously as a proto gay child, yeah. you know, wanting to. I was obsessed with the Oscars and, of course, wanted to see it. But I knew, you know, from the trailer alone that this is not something my parents are going to let me see. <laughs> so I think I had to wait, like, maybe a year or two before I could rent it on iTunes behind their back. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> and then watch it on my phone in, in bed. Yeah. Um, but I remember watching it. and It's not really one of my favorite Blanchett performances. I love the movie. I mean, it's just... it's. A wild fucking movie. It's such, so wild. <laughs> it's a, I mean, but I remember watching. I remember watching it in bed, and I remember the scene where Blanchette storms out of her house, and the mascara is running. Yes, and her hair is wild, here and she's I just like, "Here I am, here I am." <laughs> and I remember watching that on my iPhone or my iPod. Sorry, mm-hmm. Richard Eyre, that I was watching it on my iPod scrolling back and then watching it again and then doing that maybe like two or three more times just because I was like oh this is this is crazy and this I mean in my mind that the louder the performance the better yeah at that point I don't think I don't know how I I I don't think I watched it since then actually but Mm. so I'm not sure how well it would hold up but it holds up I've watched you know but you know I'm very not the best witness as (laughs) quick when it comes to Kate but I love it yeah I'm sure I, I would I'm sure it's still like a delectable, just yeah. bonkers. Yeah. And Judy's movie. amazing. Isn't yeah, it? Judy Dench is so great. That was the first time I really became aware of her as just a force. Yeah. And is there a time when you thought she was underrated? I asked John. John is my partner. Um, about this yesterday, and he said Carol. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she didn't win any major award for yeah, it, and we have not. Xavier Dolan to thank for that. Oh, fuck we, Xavier. We Dillon. know what you did at Cannes. Fuck you, Dolan. I mean, you said it, I know that. But, <laughs> so obviously, she's not underrated in Carol. Everybody Although loves she de- that. She deserves some more awards for it. Yeah. But I would say, I think in truth, that same year, she's mm. pretty great. Yeah. I think she's... A great performance. Again, it's we're watching a, an actress just imbue this part with so much emotional life mm-hmm. and, you know, making the movie better 
by compare, you know, because of it. Mm-hmm. But I also she was pretty good in in <laughs> Where'd You Go, Bernadette? Oh my god, I love you for that because nobody likes that movie. I think there's it's probably you, me, and seven other people who saw it. But I, I, I was like quite her in good. it too. I <laughs> I have this theory. And it, I floated it by John a few times, so he's well aware of it. But I only think that Kate really flourishes when she's playing extraordinary women. Mm. And whether oh, that yeah. I feel like, you know, whether it's extraordinarily royal or extraordinarily demented, as in Blue mm-hmm. Jasmine, or extraordinarily Carol, you know, like yeah. or extraordinarily Bob Dylan. Or a genius, like in yeah. Bernadette. Yeah, and so she's, you know, I think maybe a director who's a little less slack than Richard Linklater mm-hmm. might have really realized the potential of that Perform. match between actress and character. Mm-hmm. But I think for what it is, I think she gives it... I just found it very moving. Yeah. I feel like I she really too. responded to that character mm-hmm. and the unfulfilled potential of it, yeah. of, of that character specifically. Yeah. The Golden Globes agrees. Well, but <laughs> again... I think you look at, we, people, you know, look at that nomination and you think, oh, of course they nominated her. It's Kate Blanchett. They just nominated her by default. But I think she earned it. Yeah, it's the, I thought it was a deserved nomination. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think it's going to be in the, you know, it won't be like the film people hold up when. No. Because know, the film itself is not entirely successful. Yeah, but I think she, I think she makes you realize or even think about the tougher, you know, more coherent film that might have been. Yeah. So Kate, as we speak, is on set with, with Guillermo Rooney. del Toro. With Rooney, but also with Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. So that begs two questions. Who is your favorite Kate scene partner? The most common answer for that is Rooney. And who would you like to see her work with? Well, you can I'm say Rooney. <laughs> okay, obviously my answer is Rooney Mara. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, perfection. I, I wouldn't say maybe it's, I mean, after Rooney. Mm-hmm. But I really, I love what she establishes with Matt Damon in Ripley. Oh, interesting. Oh, Ripley's th- so delicious. Yeah, I mean, just an exquisite, beautiful, perfectly cast movie. But And it's and in a role that we don't really see her try any, I mean, mm. or that she's never really been cast in before since yeah. then. You know, this earnest, kind of awkward society mm-hmm. woman. I mean, usually when she's playing society women, she's confident and very Carol-esque. Yeah. But there's something so moving about the way she pines for Matt Damon in that mm. movie. And the way that he seems ready to reciprocate it. Or maybe not even reciprocate it, but the way he seems equally touched by her affections mm-hmm. and definitely fond of her. Yeah. The bond between them in that seems very pure and innocent. Yeah. And... She brings out something new in him. And I think he also responds pretty beautifully to her affections in that movie. Yeah. yeah. Now that you, you brought the town to Mr. Ripley, I just thought of an answer for my own question is like, who would I like to see her work with? Mm-hmm. And it's a sad answer because it will never happen. She and Philip Seymour Hoffman have never been in a uh, movie together and they were such good friends in real life. So, yeah. so that's sad that we'll never see that because they are as intense they're very, both of them are very intense actors and I would have just loved to see that combustion. What would have happened? I would, I would probably pay any exorbitant fee to see them in like a Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf revival. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. That's a great answer. Oh, he's, no, that just, you've just devastated me. And you wanted to end on an uplifting <laughs> note, Matata. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's such a sad answer. Um, I'd like to see her work with Viola Davis, and Viola Davis has gone on record as saying that's who she would uh, like to work with. I mean, I don't know what movie that would be. Let them remake Lila and Eve. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, oh by this point, it doesn't matter, right? Like, Are you bit- them, Yeah, I don't know. It'd be amazing to see them on stage together. I don't oh, think I would yeah. survive that production, oh whatever God, it yes. would be. Yeah. Um, because they're both people who love to work on stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like my answer to that question could just be Kate and any actress, you know? Yeah. Meryl. Meryl. Or even like... You Marion know. Cotillard. I mean, we know that... Oh my god, don't even get me started. <laughs> that would blow my mind. I think Kate would probably really... We know how hard she rides for Amy Adams. Oh yes, she loves Amy, yeah. I think that would be... That's her favorite very actress. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah, so Kate and, and any actress. And Kate and Amy don't do the same thing. They no. are not the same type of actor, so that would be 
mm-hmm. really something to behold. Yeah. We got someone's gotta do it. Yeah. Someone, we need more more Kate Blanchett with actress co- collaborations. Yes. Thank you so much, Matthew. This was such a joy to have you on to talk about Blue Jasmine and everything. You were a fantastic guest. And before we go, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you and your work? Um, You can find me on Twitter, begrudgingly tweeting, um, (laughs) at ang underscore Matthew. You you can find my work at TribecaFilm.com or by my own website, MatthewAng.net. Read me if you want, or don't. (laughs) <laughs> and you can find me on Twitter at M-E underscore says and follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Sundays with Kate. And until next time, thank you for listening.